Well, uh, let me start all over again on this Sunday. There's a few gremlin, uh, gremlins at work. Um, hello, welcome, good afternoon. Namaste, Nisambula, Vinaka to all of you from Sydney, Australia. I am Sashi Singh and welcome to Sashi Singh's Talking Point. We had a hiccup. Facebook actually just uh, blocked me all of a sudden and uh, my accounts were frozen and I had to very, very quickly get my technician to re-log, to re-enter a new password and to start uh, on Facebook again. So we seem to be on. We've got some viewers back. Uh, um, my apologies if you joined in earlier and uh, all of a sudden you were kicked out, so to say, because I got locked out of Facebook. Well, to begin the show this afternoon, welcome back once again, and uh, hopefully we will have our chief guest. He was waiting. We're trying to send him a new link. Uh, and um, Nikhil, I know you're in the background. Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Um, so thank you. So in today's program, shortly, we will be speaking to our chief guest, the uh, Honorable Pio Tikunduandua, Member of Parliament, Fiji, and President of the National Federation Party. I request that you please share the SSTP page on your own timelines so that we may share the interview with Mr. Tikundu Nuandua with as many interested people as possible to ensure that you receive instant notifications for all future programs. Please like the SSTP page and follow us too. To begin our program today, it is my pleasure to welcome our regular contributor, Nikhil Singh, to tell us of the key happenings of the political week in Fiji and in Australia. Nikhil, welcome to episode 8 and a very good afternoon to you. Well, Nikhil, uh, it's been quite an interesting week in Australia and in Fiji, politics-wise. Parliament resumed in Fiji this week with the notable absence of the Prime Minister, Frank Marimarama. Several bills were introduced for the first sitting week of the year. The uh, opposition protested at the way these bills in were introduced. What happened? Yes, Sashi, Parliament resumed on Monday last week. Um, as you stated, the Prime Minister was not in attendance um, in relation to the bills, what happened was that on Wednesday evening, just after 9 p.m., as I understand, the government tabled four bills. I will not go into uh, details on those individual bills, uh, but it came out as a bit of an ambush for the opposition uh, because the bills tabled that evening had to be debated the next uh, day and voted on the next day. Um, government tabled these bills on, under what's called Standing Order 51, um, Sashi, I am guessing you will touch on this for a deeper analysis with your guest today. Absolutely. Uh, i much rather get it from the horse's mouth, so to say, and uh, great minds think alike. Let's leave uh, Standing Order 51 there for now, Nick. Thank you. What else happened? We Well, I note that, uh, as you reported last week, on the impending visit to Fiji by the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, he was supposed to have a meeting with the Prime Minister, and uh, did this eventuate? Uh, Mr. Blinken arrived in Fiji yesterday. Uh, it's a very short visit, in fact, a matter of hours. Um, and he was officially welcomed by the acting Prime Minister, Aya Sayat Kayum. Um, Fiji Village reported that the acting Prime Minister was joined by uh, a couple of his cabinet colleagues and the police uh, commissioner and the army commander. Uh, this is the first visit by a uh, U.S. Secretary of State since uh, 1985. It has been reported that discussions between the two countries included um, uh, the climate crisis, ending the COVID-19 pandemic, disaster assistance, and strengthening the commitment to democracy, regional solidarity, and prosperity in the Pacific. Um, I did report last week, Sashi, that there was speculation Frank Banyamarama was on his way back to Fiji to meet with Blinken. However, it remained only that, a speculation. Um, no doubt he is still recovering from his heart surgery in Melbourne. All right, and closer to home, the Australian Federal Parliament uh, also resumed this week. Nikhil, please take us through some of the highlights. Yes, the Federal Parliament resumed last week for a two-week... Uh, uh, my apologies... 
the, the parliament resumed last week uh, for a two-week session before a six-week break. Uh, not a bad gig to have, Sashi. Um, but uh, overall, not a good week uh, at all for Scott Morrison. Still a bit bruised from those leaked uh, text message exchange um, uh, coming from his colleagues. Um, Morrison was hoping for some respite uh, as Parliament resumed. Uh, it only got worse. Uh, it pretty much became a case of with friends like that, who needs enemies. Uh, Morrison and his government suffered a humiliating uh, defeat on the floor of Parliament as the government's controversial religious discrimination bill was put to a vote. Uh, humiliating because five government MPs revolted against their own party and crossed the floor to vote with the opposition. Uh, now, this bill eventually passed after amendments were made to the satisfaction of those who had crossed the floor, uh, but the government seeing the real threat of the bill being defeated in the upper house uh, decided not to pursue the bill in the Senate. This means the government has shelved the bill indefinitely. Um, it's unlikely that uh, the bill will be resolved before the election. And if the floor of parliament wasn't causing um, Scott Morrison enough headache, information about a cabinet meeting was leaked to the press, or at least the journalist. ABC reported uh, that the leak revealed the Prime Minister's most senior colleagues rejected his plan to introduce uh, uh, a legislation for a, a federal ICAC um, as he scrambled to rustle support for his signature religious discrimination bill. Uh, so a revolt, of, a revolt on the floor of Parliament, Sashi, by five of his colleagues, and then in Cabinet, where he was effectively rolled. Well, there's a lot more to happen, I'm sure, as the election year rolls by. Now, Nikhil, um, unions have recorded a big, big win on superannuation for workers. What can you tell us about this campaign and uh, what does it mean for an Australian worker? Yes, Sashi, the unions ran a very long, hard-fought campaign to remove what, what was a threshold uh, for a worker to start uh, getting superannuation for time work. So uh, the threshold was uh, set at $450. Uh, if you're not earning that amount, you wouldn't attract superannuation. Uh, that threshold has now been removed, meaning that you get uh, you, you start attracting superannuation um, uh, the moment you uh, you start working. Brilliant! That's wonderful news for all workers in Australia. Uh, excellent news indeed. Now let's move towards the uh, New South Wales state by-election results. Uh, it was Super Saturday yesterday in New South Wales. With four by-elections, including the seat of Willoughby, which was uh, vacated by the New South Wales Premier Gladys uh, Berejiklian, and the seat of Strathfield, uh, vacated by the former opposition and New South Wales Labour leader, Jody McKay. Do we have the results as yet? Sashi, we do. These are not official um, results. We'll have to wait for a few more days, possibly weeks, because of the postal ballots that will come through and will have to be... Uh, counted, but what I can report is uh, in the seat of Willoughby, as you mentioned, uh, vacated by the former New South Wales Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, um, that seat has been retained by the Liberals. Uh, the Labour Party did not field a candidate because it is a Liberal stronghold, uh, but there was a swing recorded against the Liberals in the seat of Willoughby. Um, you mentioned the former Labour leader uh, in New South Wales, Johnny McKay. Uh, that seat in Stratfield has been retained by Labour, but it's not all good news because uh, Labour in that seat has reported a swing um, against them uh, and they've won the seat with a very slim margin. Um, in the seat of Monaro, uh, vacated by the former Deputy New South Wales Premier, uh, that has been retained by the Nationals, uh, but again, a, a significant swing against the Nationals uh, and that going to, uh, to Labour. Uh, Sashi, the biggest upset uh, uh, was in the seat of Biga. Uh, that was the seat held uh, previously by the New South Wales Transport Minister, Andrew Constance, uh, a very popular candidate uh, in that electorate. Uh, but for the first time in history, that seat has been won by the uh, New South Wales Labour um, in, in, in Dr. Michael Holland, uh, who, uh, who commands the respect of all sides of politics. So a, a major upset, a big win for Labour uh, in Bega. Certainly it will have some impact uh, uh, as we head towards the federal election. Well, we're heading for some very interesting times uh, in terms of the federal elections, that's for sure. 
there's leaks, more leaks than a sieve, and uh, we'll see how Australia's political agenda progresses in terms of our federal elections. So, well, Nick, uh, that's all for today. That's all on your plate for today. I was actually, I really look forward to your conversation with, uh, with the guest today, who I understand uh, was a very senior uh, military man um, and now is the president of the National Federation Party. So I'll sit back and uh, enjoy the program, that segment. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, as usual, for your contribution this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a safe and blessed week. Cheers. Thank you. Well, let me say that you're watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Welcome back. We had a serious glitch right at the beginning. If you did join in and then you were uh, abruptly cut off, what happened was that Facebook actually blocked me. Uh, I was trying to take too many people and my account got uh, blocked off. So uh, my assistant had to very quickly uh, re-log, put in a new password, satisfy Facebook that uh, we were not scammers or anything like that. But we're back on and I'm uh, absolutely privileged to have your company this afternoon. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point on Facebook Live. Let me, at this juncture of the program, say that this program has been making news headlines a lot in the last two weeks as excerpts of our interview with uh, Mr. Siti Veni Rambuka has been dissected by some media organizations in Fiji to the extent that our interview has featured as the lead story on a few occasions. All I have to say is that on Sashi Singh's talking point, we ask the questions that Fijians all over the world want answers to. Fijians want to know. You will be interested to know that in our worldwide viewership, we have people watching from Japan, India, Samoa, Vanuatu, and the Big Five, of course, in Canada, Australia, United States of America, New Zealand, uh, and Australia. Uh, and the biggest audience, of course, is from our beautiful Fiji Islands. As I said, Fijians want to know. They want the answers. And it is my aim to bring to you a program that is fair, balanced, and that asks the questions that others may be afraid to address. So thank you for being a part of Sashi Singh's Talking Point, SSTP. Now it is time to meet our chief guest. Our chief guest is a former military officer, retired from the Republic of Fiji Military Forces, with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel after a service of 26 years. He served as Permanent Secretary for two different parts of the Civil Service and is currently a Member of Parliament and in the Republic, a Member of Parliament in the Republic of Fiji and one of three members of the National Federation Party in the House of Representatives. This afternoon, in a one-to-one -one interview with the Honourable Pio Tikunduandua, we will discuss his time in the military, his role as Permanent Secretary, his time in Parliament, and other very interesting topics that he can enlighten us on. And uh, with this, it is now my pleasure to welcome on Sashi Singh's Talking Point this afternoon, my Chief Guest, the Honourable Pio Tikunduandua, MP. Good afternoon, welcome and Nisam Bolavinaka to you, Mr. Tikunduandua. Good afternoon, Sashi, and Nisam Bolavinaka from Suwa. I hope you are well this Sunday afternoon. I am, thank you. Uh, actually, I feel good today. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for accepting my invitation to be my chief guest uh, this afternoon. And as I normally begin with my guests, uh, I normally like to begin with a brief discussion on uh, our guests' background. And uh, I believe you and I have something in common. I understand that you were born in uh, Namalata, Tailevu. My family background is also from those parts. Uh, my father and his family were from Nakitu in Tailevu. So um, that's something we have in common. May I begin by asking you, what is your earliest memory? My earliest memory was Cyclone Bibi, uh, Tashi. It was mm -hmm. in 1975, sorry, 1972, when I was uh, five and a half years old. 
that was the first big thing I remembered. And um, and um, at that time I was living in um, uh, in my village of Lakorvo where I was born. And um, it was quite a nasty experience. Not one expects at five years old coming into the world. Well, most of us have uh, the image of uh, Hurricane Bibi firmly entrenched in our minds. Uh, that is uh, something that we haven't uh, forgotten. Now, in your maiden speech in Parliament in October of 2014, you said that you came from, and I quote, the most humble of origins, born in considerable hardship to a single mother. You paid tribute to your mother, Senoveva Ranandi. How would you describe the hardship you endured and the role played by your dear mother? My mother was my inspiration, as you know, and uh, as you said, uh, I was single-handedly raised by her and, uh, and assisted by my grandfather. My mother was a single mother, uh, and um, uh, we lived with my grandfather for a very, very long time, until actually when my, until my grandfather died. But my mother never got married, and um, <clears throat> she... You know, she is the beacon of motherhood in, in as far as I'm concerned. And she really is the reason that I'm here talking to you. Wow, wonderfully described. Uh, beacon of motherhood, I like that. And uh, I also know that you paid uh, tribute to your grandfather and you called him your mentor, Mosesi Randokana. What role did your grandfather play in the life of a young Pio Tikundundua? Not only was he my mentor, uh, Sashi, he, he played the role that every dad would play to raise, you know, um, to raise a son, become a responsible person of any society. And, uh, you know, he lived in the village all of his life and he understood uh, the village community and um, how it is led and the relationships. So he made sure in what he taught me and mentored me to do that I would become a person of um, uh, of um, being responsible enough and um, you know he actually prepared me for manhood so to speak and I was very very fortunate that I had it. Wonderful. Now after primary school in Natovi you attended uh, St. Vincent College and then St. John's College in Levuka how difficult was it for you to be away from home to pursue education in Levuka? So she asked them 10 years as a boarding student in Natovi. From the tender age of six when I was in class one. And after 10 years, after passing my Fiji Junior exams, I left Natovi 10 years later. Mm -hmm. And um, I went across the passage to Ovalau and studied at St. John's College in the Wadi. And um, I spent two beautiful years there of my life. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the outcome of that is not only my academic maturity, but it taught me one big thing, and that was humility and the okay. service to mankind. That's where I got. I was very, very fortunate, and I want to raise it here. We have been raised by the congregation of the mission priests who are in sanction and the sister of Our Lady of Nazareth, and also the Marist priest from New Zealand when I went to St. John's. Okay. Now, when you finished school, what was it that prompted you to join the RFMF Cadet Training School? Why? Why the military? Thank you, Sashi. I was, um, I was influenced in many ways. Um, um, I think the better part of the influence that I got at the village was because people saw the characters and the qualities that I had and the standard of education that I had and the only really perhaps uh, work that they thought that was best fitted me uh, was to become an officer in the army. So they pushed me up through the direction through a couple of uncles. And um, the, for the first time, um, I have cousins also, but they were from the Pickering side, and I saw their pictures at my auntie's place, and uh, my auntie was married to the Pickerings from Rewa. 
and two of the Pickering siblings were both officers in the military. And I tell you what, when I saw them uh, and their photograph, that was, I mean, that was it. Uh, that was the inspiration that actually made me join the Army. All right, you were educated at uh, multiple universities, including University of New South Wales, the Centre for Defence and Strategic Studies in Canberra, the uh, Naval Pros Graduate School in Monterey, California, reaching the rank of Lieutenant Colonel after graduating from the Australian Defence Force Command and Staff College in 2006. When was it that you were identified as officer material or was it your will and determination that directed you towards your military career path? I joined the military in 1988, Sashi. And, um, and if you look at it, that was three years after I left school. And uh, I joined, I, the first office I joined was the Ethiopia Affairs Addiction Ring Project. Then I spent a short time uh, in the judicial department being a court officer or a translator, uh, you know, court interpreter. It was there in 1987 that I applied to to attend the regular option selection board, and I was accepted. And that, that's when I joined the military, and I mm -hmm. found my way. Uh, you know, I rose through the ranks through education, and some of those institutions were the higher training institutions that I actually went to. And let me say that I was very privileged because at that high level of military life, I was not only trained on, um, on military operational skills and knowledge, I was trained in, you know, in the art of everything else, including governance and, uh, and you know, uh, military and political strategy and a lot of them. So um, uh, let me say, uh, my, people call me a high flyer in the military. So... Um, I'm very grateful for that to the RSMF and I must say that I was able to, to be able to, put, to be put through all those uh, courses and education. And as a military officer, you had served in Lebanon, Egypt, East Timor and the Solomon Islands, I believe. How did you find things serving abroad as a soldier? It was quite challenging, particularly from a family perspective. Uh, and uh, I'll be honest with you, um, Sashi, because it um, it affected my family at the time, particularly when I went from my first tour of duty to Lebanon in 1989. So um, <clears throat> it was very hard to go. Uh, particularly, it was very hard on the family, you know, leaving our families behind. Um, my... Uh, my services in Lebanon included uh, services within the battalion, the Fijian battalion, the first battalion that was there. So I remember two appointments I served there. I was a platoon commander along the coastal road that led from Lebanon to Israel. And secondly, I became, on my second tour, I was the adjutant of the battalion. And, um, and halfway through my job, I was asked to and I was transferred and promoted uh, to take up a role as a senior staff officer administration at the UNIFIL headquarters, the UNHQ in Lebanon. And um, in Sinai, I only served one tour in the Sinai. I served the tour and I worked as a senior staff officer operations at the multinational force and observer headquarters in uh, Sinai uh, in Egypt. That was my, and that was between 1991 and 1992. I went to East Timor in 2002 as part of UNTA-ED and UNMISET, um, and I worked at the operations branch. Later on, I, I commanded and I led the Fijian contingent to Ramsey in the Solomon Islands in 2004. So um, I was actually, I led the second detachment that took over from the first one. And uh, that was in uh, 2004, as I said. Which tour of duty, duty do you think was the toughest? Lebanon was the toughest, particularly my second term as adjutant, and that was from 1995 to 1996. And I say, uh, as I said earlier, I was the adjutant of the battalion, so... 
In the battalion headquarters, there is the commanding officer who is the colonel. You have an operations officer who is usually in the rank of major. And the captain who looks after the administration of the battalion. And he holds a, um, you know, a ceremonial role as well in the battalion. But the important role that I wanted to, to share with you, I was the commander of the battalion headquarters company and I was made the site commander of the battalion HQ that was based in Kana. And on the 8th of April, sorry, the 8th of April in 1996, when I was commanding this position, we, there was, uh, um, there was war in South Lebanon. And there was, a, there was refugees everywhere because for about a month, Israel was bombarding South Lebanon from land, from the air, and from the sea. And there were refugees, and um, they crowded at our gate wanting protection. So I, I was part of the decision to actually look after them. But it was very unfortunate, Sashi, that when they were with us, the headquarters of the Fijian battalion was bombarded by Israel from the air. Wow. And it killed close to 500 men, women, and children. We were very fortunate for the Fijian soldiers that only four of our people, four of our soldiers and officers were seriously injured, but there were no fatalities for us. That was the biggest, the hardest thing that I ever experienced. And I will tell you one incident that really touched me. So after the camp was bombarded, there was people injured and lying everywhere different degrees of injuries. And when I paraded the soldiers at the end to clean up the camp and attend to the injured people, injured civilians here, I mean, I had to ask the soldiers a big favor because we did not have the capacity to look after them all. So for them to judge the seriousness of the injuries that people sustained. And because they were limited facility and they were limited to help them, to discern who needed immediate and who did not need immediate care, which meant that in through that process that they would make a choice of who was going to live and who was going to die. I made that call. So that was like the toughest decision or the toughest situation that I've ever got um, when I was in Lebanon wouldn't envy you at all in those circumstances. Now, you also held uh, several leadership roles, as you've mentioned, before you became the Chief Staff Officer Operations at the RFMF. Briefly, because we have a lot to discuss, what is the duty or key role of the Chief Staff Officer Operations? What responsibilities uh, does that role entail? Okay, essentially, the Chief Staff Officer, he plans and coordinates the RSMF activities for all of the RSMF units. So, meaning if there was a natural disaster, he would be the focal point of the RSMF effort. That is uh, uh, the job of the Chief Staff Officer Operations. In a okay. Nutshell. Well, I'll leave it at that because we'll discuss uh, certain aspects of the military in our interview uh, later on. Um, how would you describe the life of a military officer? Well, <clears throat> came with a lot of privilege and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed my career, let me say that, because I wanted to become an officer. But it came with a lot of responsibility, and I'm glad I was trained for it. And it is one of the most enjoyable job, you know, a career that any man or woman or young men and women in Fiji could pursue. All right. Well, having said that, then, in your long service in the RFMF, your long service to the military, what would you say was the highlight of your military career? The highlight of my military career is um, when I was appointed the, the private secretary of the PSO to the newly appointed commander of the RSMF. Uh, Don't tell I, me. I'll stop you there. Don't yes. tell me why. We'll leave it there, because I have specific questions on that role for you later on. 
I hope you don't mind. No, I'm okay with that. Thank you. Now, what was the lowest point of your military career then? The lowest point of my military career, really, as a professional soldier in uniform and with all my military education and non-military education, that when I was asked to leave the active service of the military to become a civilian, to serve in the, in the military government, uh, from uh, 19, uh, from 2007. Now I say why, Sashi, because it meant that I had to completely live my old life. And only to believe that I'm still a military officer, but wearing this throughout. And since then, I have never got back into uniform. Well answered. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, the Thinking People's Program, coming your way on Facebook Live with our chief guest this afternoon, the Honourable Theo Tikunduandua. Now, uh, Mr. Tikunduandua, let us move our discussion towards the thought, thought process that goes through in the military barracks. And uh, I know that in the military service, there's a chain of command, starting from the very top, from the commander of the RFMF, and the chain of command filters down, down the ranks. Let us look, for instance, at the 2006 coup d'etat, the 2006 coup. How much of planning went into the events leading up to the coup of 2006? Shashi, I have uh, absolutely no idea, because mm -hmm. as you know, I was in Australia at the time, but in fact... Um, I had left Fiji halfway through uh, 2005 to come to Melbourne in preparation for my staff college course. So I was not quite aware at all in terms of the level of preparation at the camp for that. All right. Well, taken, you were not there. But you're a military man, um, operations, uh, uh, in, into operations. Let's ask you this. Uh, how much of planning do you think would have gone into it? Uh, I mean, to, to coordinate something like that, did the planning of, do you think, I mean, I know you were not there, do you think the planning of the actual coup would have uh, begun with the then commander, Vorengimbani Marama, or did the military's top brass, such as the military council, strategize? Would they have strategized? Would they have planned the coordination? What sort of planning? I mean, I know you were not there. What do you think? Okay, if you ask me, you're asking me, Shashi, about the concept of military planning mm -hmm. and preparations. Okay. Such an event to plan for would be quite, uh, quite extensive. It's not easy to deploy thousands of soldiers in one day uh, to take over the security responsibility of a nation. Now, it would involve the a directive or a command from the commander to the members to, you know initially to his immediate officers that uh, were his uh, immediate staff officers at the time and also to the unit commanders that commanded the units of the rsmf because he would need them now i would say that at the beginning they would be probably be surrounded by a whole lot of uh, secrecy uh, in terms of how naturally that would work because it you know secrecy is an essential element of it because you do not want everything you plan to be out there in the public domain so it'd be restricted to see one till perhaps the 11th hour when the rest would be told so um, but in the military i would say this now the commander exercises full command of the rfmf meaning he is the only one that exercises that is responsible for everything that happens within the force. No one else has that responsibility. So he would first and foremost be, you know, be the person that exerts or gives all the orders, supported by his staff and main unit commanders, before that was designated to everyone else. You've just said that uh, there's an element of secrecy involved. 
And uh, obviously, one would assume that the discussions at the top level, at the top hierarchy, would be top secret, hush hush. Now, in your experience, how long do you think uh, before the actual strike would the foot soldiers have known that there was going to be a military takeover? So, see, having not understood how things were happening here, like I said, I was in Canberra. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> there are um, before the hood soldiers, the hood soldiers would be, by the time the orders get to the hood soldiers, there would have been a considerable time, you know, um, that the commander then would have stand with his immediate staff who would help him to do that. So um, um, I think if we took it into perspective with Sashi, uh, you would have known that for a long while, the commander at the time, was the current prime minister, was having a drawn out, um, um, what's the word? Uh, war of one. words, war, war of words yes. with uh, with the late yes. Prime Minister Leyson in Garisay. That, that is correct. And then words, you know, uh, uh, um, messages were exchanged between him and the government and uh, by Mr. Garisay. So it was like the build up was, uh, it, it did not come immediately as a surprise per se, because he was almost saying that this is going to happen. That's what I was hearing from Canberra when I was there. But he was almost telling, so uh, the government, this is what I want to do. And, um, and and that was like, it took, uh, it was building up for more than six months, I believe, uh, if I, you know, but I tend to be corrected in that regard. Yes, well, you, you're quite right. In the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, uh, the, the, the tensions were quite uh, high. It was escalating more or less on a daily basis. Now, uh, just just the thought process in the military, if I may ask you this. You did mention that the commander is the ultimate person who makes the decisions. But uh, is there ever any room for discussion, consultation, any debates between the, the officers closest to the commander? Or is it simply a matter of just following the commander's order in, in any sort of event? Yeah, in, in, in a natural um, sort of, uh, in peacetime when there is no war, uh, and also even during operations, um, the commander has his, he has his staff, it's called the general staff, and they look after every aspect of the, particularly I'm talking about the army here, and it's led by the chief of staff, and there are other officers, like I was the chief staff officer. So I would have been the S3 of the, uh, we call it G3 at the time, the grand staff um, of three branches, which, or three which is operations. And mm -hmm. there is the two branch, which is intelligence. And then there is the four branch, which is logistics. There is the one branch, which is personnel and involvement and money. So you see, all this is available to whoever is the commander to use. And I would assume that he would have used that. Would have used that under the, the leadership of the chief of staff. But remember also, there was the land force commander who actually is the head of the, of the group that commands the, uh, the actual units of the RSMS. So you would be talking to them, both the commanders and also the staff. Well, I mean, as is obvious, it, it was a military uh, military command. It was a military movement because uh, even before the actual coup, the, the troops went and cos uh, confiscated the arms at the headquarters of the police division in Nasinu on 4th December. And then they also surrounded the Nasova Police Academy in Suva, removed weapons from the armory there. So it was a well-coordinated attack. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, the Italian Dominican friar, philosopher, Catholic priest, and doctor of the church, stated that conscience is the voice of reason, as it enables man to fully assess good actions before taking them. Let me add that the voice of conscience is our ability to make practical decision in the light of ethical values and principles. So voice of uh, conscience 
uh, is a person's moral compass of doing right and wrong, as well as the consciousness of one's action. My question to you is, is there ever an occasion in military life when a soldier can rely on his voice of conscience, or is it a military rule, code, and belief that a soldier must on all accounts follow the command at all times, follow orders? Thank you, Sashi. Section 69 of the IMEAC 1955, um, there is a charge that is uh, the charge of, um, uh, sorry, um, it's not section 69, but there is actually a clause within the IMEAC 1955 that says um, a soldier cannot disobey a lawful command. The word here being lawful, okay. that is the key word. Soldiers get trained to exercise, I mean, uh, the capacity to be able to do exactly as noted by St. Thomas Aquinas. Because you deal with people and there's examples throughout the world. And unfortunately, they always pop up when something bad happens. Where, people, where soldiers do not exercise their conscience and do not uh, really actually follow an unlawful command. So within the military leadership in itself and the law, it gives the soldier the right to not follow an unlawful command. But that is a decision, a consciousness that needs to be developed by the soldier that needs to exercise that decision. But if the command is lawful, then, then the soldier must follow that. Okay. Now, you mentioned that you were not in Fiji during the 2006 coup. You were, in fact, in Canberra. Um, I want you to answer one or two questions, and then we move on. Uh, number one, were you at all, even if you were in Canberra, ever involved in the planning and execution of that coup? Were you aware of the coup in the making? First question, I was not aware, uh, I was not involved in any of the planning coup stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. I was aware that a coup had occurred in Fiji. That's after the fact? That is correct, after it happened, yes, I am aware. I was okay. aware at the time, before I returned, yeah, and returned to the RSMS. Okay, and uh, would you happen to know where was the then commander at the time of that coup? You're talking about 2006? Yes. Okay, I believe he was in Fiji. I believe when he did the coup, he did the coup here in Fiji. He was in Fiji at the time. Would he have been at the barracks uh, giving instructions or commands? Oh, he, he would have been like, he would have been, I mean, I would... I would uh, I would assume that the more, the better part of his time would be you know in, in in barracks at Queen Elizabeth Barracks where his office was located, and um, you know with that uh, such a, a high level of pressure he would be at the heartbeat of it. So uh, there's no better place to be other than there. Thank you. On Sashi Singh's Talking Point Live on Facebook this afternoon, our chief guest is the Honourable Pio Tikunduandua. MP and President of the National Federation Party. Please share this link on your timeline if you can, as uh, you may include your family and friends in this broadcast. And a full recording of this program can be viewed later on by family and friends if they wish to worldwide on Facebook and also on YouTube as well. Now, uh, Mr. Tikundundua, um, Bridge Law, let me change the subject for a while and uh, Still staying with things military, I would like to discuss briefly what has been well documented about the late Professor Bridgelal's detention some years back. I have received by social media questions in relation to his uh, detention, so I'll limit the questions. I've received a number of questions, but I'll limit the question to just one or maybe two. As we know, Professor Bridgelal was detained in November 2009. To quote the late Professor Bridge Lal, who said in reference to the abuse he faced, and I quote, internal verbal abuse, 
foul language, explosive anger on the part of the officer who was interrogating me. There was no physical assault, but I was told in no uncertain terms that I had to leave the country within 24 hours voluntarily. They wouldn't deport me, they won't deport me, but there was no place for me in Fiji at the moment. My one question to you, sir, were you ever involved in this episode with Professor Bridge Long? The short answer to that is, uh, in terms of his detention, no. In terms of the knowledge um, that, uh, um, that, um, that uh, he was um, uh, deported from Fiji, that I knew, that I learned later. When so it happened. that, again, is that after the fact? That is correct, yes, after, after it did happen. Uh, okay. Because I was, at the time, as you know, I was Permanent Secretary in the Prime Minister's Office. I believe that was in 2009. All right. So, yeah. since there was no involvement in your part, we'll move on. You've just uh, mentioned the Permanent Secretary roles, and perhaps it's a good time to uh, move there. Let me discuss your transfer. As you said, uh, you left your military life, and you, as you said, became a civilian. And... Uh, so if I may recall, following the 2006 uh, coup, uh, a number of military officers were po appointed to senior positions, and you were one of them. Initially, you were appointed as the Permanent Secretary of uh, Justice, and then in 2008, uh, as you mentioned, as the Permanent Secretary at the Prime Minister's Office. Firstly, what were your uh, initial thoughts on the transfer? When I was told that I should go across and become permanent secretary of prime minister, actually, I, to be very honest, I was a bit lost. Because I, it was challenging enough because I was only a few months in my, in the job that I was doing as permanent secretary for justice and public enterprise. And then I was moved to this uh, job where I, I had a, um, I had an understanding of what it would be, but I was um, I was not fully aware of the challenges of it. But uh, one thing I know is that I was up for the challenge, you know, to do the job. So that transition from being a career soldier to then become becoming permanent secretary in in the administrative arm of the government machinery, the civil service structure, uh, you said uh, maybe experience lacked, but you had. Uh, the, the vibe in you to go for that challenge. Is that true? I was, like I told you earlier, I was very, very fortunate because I, <clears throat> in my military education, it pretty much prepared me for many things other than just military operations. Particularly in my studies uh, at the Australian uh, Defence College, my studies at the Naval Postgraduate College, uh, my other uh, experiences, you know, with the the, 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 the U.S. Army and those places that I went. So I, I, I had a fair understanding of the government machinery and, uh, you know, what it required in terms of the service. So, but one thing I did, I had to teach myself a lot. Yes. Essentially, I had to teach myself. Um, mind you, I, you know, I, I worked in the public service in the Ministry of Itauke, then Ministry of Fiji and Affairs in the Institute of Language and Culture. So I had that experience from there, even though just as a clerk. Then later as a court officer from the Judicial Department. And, and I was there for, you know, about a year and a half. And those experiences were very, very valuable because I had to undergo, you know, examinations for the public service, H1, H2, general orders. So I was very familiar with how the operations of the public service as a civil servant would operate. Only now, there will be at the top calling the shots, understanding, you know, that it was a military government. And I had to adjust myself that I wasn't commanding soldiers, but I was leading civilians. That was the biggest challenge that I thought came out of my job and transferring to the Prime Minister's office. Well, you served as the Permanent Secretary for Justice and Public Enterprise for a short while. Who did you report to and how did you find that experience? I reported my minister was the, the current attorney general and the acting prime minister right now, Aya Said Kayum. We had, I must tell you, we had a very good working relationship at the time. And uh, and uh, I I did not have any issues uh, 
as the permanent secretary for justice in terms of the work that I had to perform. And uh, particularly, um, if you understand the Ministry of Justice, um, it dealt with a lot of the registries, the register for births, deaths and marriages, uh, the whole lot of other registries. That was what it was naturally uh, restricted to. All of the laws were done up in the office of the Solicitor General, so to speak. So uh, the primary work that I did there was actually making sure that all these functions of the ministry were performing, you know, did, were, were operating efficiently and effectively. So that really was my uh, the extent of my work. But I did not, uh, uh, the honesty is here, I did not have any, you know, any issues at the time. Okay. And uh, Mr. Tikundundua, you were then appointed, as you said, uh, the Permanent Secretary to the Office of the Prime Minister, when once again your former commander was your boss. As Permanent Secretary to the Office of the Prime Minister, what did your work entail? Essentially, it was to help the Prime Minister um, lead the government. That is my primary role in all of the functions of the office of the Prime Minister. Uh, from policy, and um, one major part of my work is the efficient running of cabinet, the civilian cabinet of the military government. So that was also under my portfolio. But under the office of the Prime Minister, well, there was the policy division and um, and other minor divisions that looked at projects that uh, the office of the Prime Minister was responsible for. But all in essence, uh, Sashi, really is to do the work on how the Prime Minister and the Commander wanted, you know, the direction of how the military government and what it wanted to achieve to be achieved. That was my role uh, at the time. Now, as I've just said, you were working under the leadership of the Prime Minister, who was your former Commander. What were your observ observations about Vorengi Mbani Marama in his role as Prime Minister? I mean, you'd served under him as the Commander of the RFMF, but now you're his permanent secretary in the Prime Minister's office. He's the Prime Minister. What were your observations? Did you see any changes in demeanor? Uh, what What did you observe in his role as the Prime Minister? Uh, Sashi, obviously, the challenges of Prime Minister is much greater than the commander. Being being commander of the RFMF, that you, you, your sole responsibility was looking after the force. Being Prime Minister was wider and it um, and uh, it demanded, you know, uh, the greatest level uh, of dedication in terms of the work for the governance of the nation, not only cabinet, but, you know, the nation in general. And um, I, I observed, you know, when I first came uh, that, um, you know, he was, he, he had a lot of um, he had a lot of help, and one came from the military council that uh, was also working at the time, also from cabinet. But uh, later on, it was featuring very strongly that uh, the attorney general, Honorable Ayesaid Kayum, now you know became his chief advisor on many things, including finance. We'll we'll we'll, we'll leave that there because that's another oh, topic okay. for discussion. I, I beg your pardon. I, I just wanted to know your feelings as to his transition from commander to prime minister. And I think you've answered that. As you said, there's a lot more responsibility. Yes. And it, Let's it, move. It, yeah, go on. It's natural for him too, actually, at the time, when I, when I arrived in 2008. Now, here you are, working very, very closely with the prime minister. You would, I assume... You would have been his eyes and his ears. After all, you had served with him uh, in the military for so, so long. Um, you were his personal staff officer or the ADC, so, so to say, uh, for so many years. And then you were at his side as the permanent secretary. How much of a confidant were you? I was a confidant in every sense of the word. I mean, I would. Um, in terms of the running of the government, and in as far as the ministry is concerned, I mean, I'm talking about the office of the Prime Minister. There was, 
I, I was aware of almost everything that was happening within the functions of the Prime Minister, the office of the Prime Minister, per se, and uh, the Prime Minister would, you know, would inform me, per se, if there was, you know, an important decision that I had to attend to. And I would uh, also, uh, you know, um, I, uh, later on in my work, I had to oversee some of the major reforms, uh, particularly the work of the Charter and later on the establishment of the FRA. So I had to I had to lead most of that work, uh, you know, so to speak. So um, um, and and uh, he trusted me in that work, so I, I did not have any issue with that. Well, obviously, there must have been a lot of trust and a lot of confidence in you because uh, from being a permanent secretary in the Prime Minister's office, all of a sudden now you're being groomed to become a candidate uh, for the first Fiji First Party to contest the elections in 2014 so that you may enter Parliament uh, uh, after the elections. Now, whose idea was it or on whose encouragement did you decide to make this transition into politics. Was it the Prime Minister? Well, he invited me. Prior to, prior to me actually um, joining politics, we were given the ultimatum, go back to camp, join politics, enter the party, or move out. He invited me to become a candidate for the Fiji First Party, which I took up. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it was, you know, for me, a measure of, uh, you know, confidence in me uh, by the Prime Minister at the time who, you know, who invited me and persuaded me to become um, a candidate for the party. All right. I was going to be a bit flippant here. Um, may as well ask you, do you think he has regrets today? I think the short answer would be yes. All right, let's move on. Let's turn the clock back to 2014. Um, what did you value most in that setup? Uh, if you look at 2014, you're uh, the permanent secretary. All of a sudden, you're campaigning for the elections. Your name's been put up as the candidate. What did you value most in that setup? It was... Uh, I, I value that, um, that it was an opportunity to continue serving the people under a different platform. Mm -hmm. Done the military, I'd become, you know, up there, service within, you know, in the highest office of the land, as permanent secretary, so I've done that. And that, that this would be also a new territory, I mean, for me, I, I was not new to politics, but political party politics and parliament it was something I I never really read into or understood. So I, I thought I just saw it as a continuation of my service and of course to to foster or to encourage the principles for which I believe, really the principles that I believed in when I came back from Australia to join the military government back in two thousand and uh, in two thousand and seven. That was those were the things that inspired me. Yeah. All right. Uh, now Again, to 2014, things are good. Uh, your relationship with uh, the Prime Minister is good. Um, you've uh, won the elections. You're a member of Parliament. And I'm just turning back the clock. In your maiden speech in Parliament, you said, uh, speaking about the Prime Minister, and I quote, and these are your words, I shared his vision then, I share his vision now, and that is the sole reason that I am in Parliament today. May I please ask you, what, in your opinion, was the Prime Minister's vision in 2014? Thank you, Sashi. I'll come very, I'll just flip back a little bit, because I need sure. to, to describe what I meant by the word then. When I was... Go ahead. When I returned in 1999, I became the first officer appointed to become the personal staff officer to the commander. So, and I was there also in 2000 when the incident of 2000 happened. I helped him to reclaim his command 
and we can talk about that later. So after 2000, I mean, I don't want to talk about 2000. You know what happened in 2000. Mm -hmm. There was no democracy. And, um, you know, Hiji was in turmoil. Then he became, what he said at the time, became, you know, the, the light. And this later was captured by Fiji Times much later, you know, when he became, you know, man of the year after that. Because of the principles of democracy that an institution like RSMF would uphold, the rule of law, you know, the, the supremacy and the, the primacy of the people, you know, which has been overridden. Those were the principle that I started with. Not only did I pick that up from 2008 when I joined, Oh, sorry, from 2007 when I joined the military government and then on to 2014. But it came back, it was far back as 2000 and the year 2000. Now, I'll jump straight back. Unfortunately, you know, in the decades after that, you know, I was beginning to question my own conscience, whether we were actually on track for that. And that kind of led in a very, very big way on why I left Fiji first. So, um, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, to, to, to go back to the question that you asked, you know, like... Uh, and and that, was, that was to share, I mean, your opinion on the Prime Minister's vision in 2014. That is correct, because he was that man in 2014, remember? Yeah, 20, sorry. Um, yeah, um, and those things were naturally aspired, you know, in the guiding document of what was then the 2013 Constitution. But what was his vision? What was his vision? He wanted Fiji, a Fijian that was equal to all under the rule of law. That is what he wanted. You know? So that, that, was, his, that was his vision going into the 2014 elections. And, uh, yes. Yes. and, and you subscribe to that? that I have correct. no problems with that. Yes, um, yes, absolutely, yeah. And that was okay. part of the reason also why... And, and that's kind of... Um, at that time, um, motivated me to, to pursue the legal, uh, you know, the po political career after he invited me. Short answer at this stage, because we will delve into your relationship with the Prime Minister further down the interview. We've just discussed his vision for 2014. Taking those principles of the vision that he had for a united Fiji, do you think that vision currently stands? Yes, no? You mean, you mean the effect of that on the nation right now? Well, the Prime Minister had a vision for, for Fiji in 2014. Do you, think he still, do you think he still has that vision for, uh, that he had in no. 2014? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. All not right. All. If you ask me, the short answer there is no. He might Will be saying the right things, which unfortunately are not his words. I can say that for sure. Okay. We will discuss that. Things. We will discuss that because sure. I've got a separate segment on that uh, uh, for our discussion. Now, you mentioned the 2000 coup. Were you at the military barracks uh, during that whole upheaval? I was there on the day of the takeover in Parliament. Yes, I was. All right. We are, well, we could have a separate program just on the 2000 coup itself, but perhaps uh, uh, in, in your role as, as a senior officer in the military, one question that I'd like to ask, which has bugged me for many, many years, why did it take something like 56 days of captivity? Why wasn't there action much, much sooner by either the military or the military command to bring an end to George Spade's coup. Why did it take that long? Okay, um, <clears throat> it did take that long. Um, it, it, it points to uh, one issue in particular I want to raise now with you, Sashi, which I, I believe led to how long those negotiations took. Because the commander at the time, you know, uh, Commodore Frank Bainimarama, was not 
in camp was not in Fiji when the, took, when the takeover in parliament happened. He was in Norway. Okay. So there was an acting commander. The commander, the acting commander was Totoko, and he had his staff also with him, who almost immediately after the coup was negotiating with the George State Group or the George State team, so to speak, who were in parliament. So he returned, I believe, a week later. The commander returned a week later. And then he took over command and responsibility and the lead in the negotiation. And he was assisted by people like, uh, you know, Tarkin Kini at the time. And that is all like public knowledge, as you know. Tarkin Kini, as you would know, was the spokesman of the RSMF at the time. And he was the one. Um, uh, you know, giving out all the press conferences in terms of the negotiations that were going on. But I am personally at the time, because I was here, so and I was like the captain, you know, my rank then was a captain, but I was in a senior position. Uh, I was not quite aware in terms of how the developments, you know, um, all the negotiations were taking place. You know, there was going back and forth. And, and uh, I know that the, uh, you know, the RSMF was preparing itself, you know, if negotiations would fail, uh, you know, for the solutions at Parliament. And uh, I am relieved that that did not have to take place because, um, you know, a military intervention there, I believe, would have been catastrophic. Um, and it would have been really sad for Fiji, so to speak. Yeah. There are some quarters who believe that... Uh... 56 days of uh, captivity for those elected officials, uh, democratically elected officials of parliament, was a long, long time to be in, 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 in lockdown, so to say. And uh, maybe we leave that discussion for another time uh, in terms of why the military took so long to finally uh, resolve this whole uh, 2000 coup. You were going to say something. Please do. Yeah, I was just going to say one day is too long. 56 days is, uh, you know, someone's got to find a proper term for it. It's almost outrageous in a sense. But this is looking back in hindsight. Obviously, at the time, there were many issues. And, you know, if you want to talk about 2000, you know, separately, as how I understood it, it would have to be the subject of another interview on another day. Well, I totally agree with that. Let's move on. Uh, we, you are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point on Facebook Live. My chief guest this afternoon is the, is the Honourable Pio Tikunduandua, Member of Fiji's Parliament and President of the National Federation Party. Now, as we look at your political career, you are then appointed the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. As, at this time, you had s stated, we will continue the task of improving the nation's roads to providing access to water to more Fijians, especially to those living outside the areas of the Water Authority of Fiji. What, in your view, was the major achievement as minister in the short period you held that post? My biggest achievement to date, and, uh, you know, this is... Um, <clears throat> uh, many would not agree with me on this one. I reform the, the Department of National Road and created the Fiji Roads Authority uh, that was enabled by, you know, decree at the time. So I, I drove and I was the driver behind that reform. And uh, to me, that was probably the biggest, uh, the biggest achievement and the biggest thing that I did, you know, successful or otherwise, I mean, Right now, you know, probably half of the people will be cursing me because the state of our roads in Fiji is quite pathetic. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at it now. Um, what, seven years afterwards, um, uh, made me regret sometimes in terms of, you know, the people that we had to lay off at the time. But it was a decision that I took and I, and I claim full responsibility for it. I will not shy from it. Now, you remain minister from September 2014 to May 2015 a short period of uh, just eight months. Were there frustrations in the role as a minister that you can share with us today, 
perhaps some of today's ministers might be experiencing the same sort of frustration in government. My biggest frustration at the time was I felt I was not able to do enough per se in terms of the resources that I was given. You know, I was aided um, because the Ministry of Infrastructure, in terms of, you know, what authority had its own board, CG Roads Authority had its own board, EFL had its own board, or what was ACA at the time. So much of the responsibility rests, you know, uh, with uh, the boards and the executives of these particular institutions, per se. But just because there was never enough to go around to be able to please the people, but you know, um, I know we, I laid out priorities of what could be done. The biggest challenge that I can tell you is to be able to, you know, to independently perform my functions as minister for infrastructure without having to be swayed either by um, influences from my two bosses, you know, and, uh, and I mean the Prime Minister and the Attorney General, that was a big one, and uh, also managing the expectation of the people in terms of reforms and the way of the state of the infrastructure. But um, I was able to do that. I, I was able to say no. So, uh, but there was never enough money to go around the system. Money is always the issue, they say. Then on 11th of uh, May 2015, you resigned in what has been documented as being for reasons of ill health. While I do not want to pry into your personal life, how sick were you to give up an active uh, political life that as minister would have also been quite lucrative financially uh, with all the other perks of the job? At the time, I had, uh, <clears throat> I was diagnosed with uh, um, cancer of the parotid gland, and um, I had cancer, and I underwent an operation uh, back in 2011, obviously with a you know, big part to my head. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, I, I'm not the fittest guy, I was not the fit colonel or the fit army officer back then. <laughs> but I was motivated, you know, like I said, for what I wanted to do and because I believed in the aspirations and the vision that made me, you know, come back to Fiji and also to join politics. So, um, I, I was, I was, I mean, I'm not, I was sick at the time. However, I'll tell you one thing, though. Psychologically at the time, I never really did, you know, I, I shared it with a number of close friends and my other mentor. Uh, my other mentor, uh, I, will, I will say that he is an Australian priest, still alive today. Mm -hmm. In 1964, his name Father Valentin. He now retires in Natobi, uh, 87 years old. Uh, he came here before I was born. He baptized me. He, he married me. And then he's telling me that one day he might bury me, which I'm afraid if he would do that. But I shared this thing in terms of conscious thing that we talked about. Because halfway through the term of the military government, and I'm telling you, this is not only, this was, this was not only the concerns that was aired by me, but this was also the concern aired by many military officers at the time, senior ones. Mm -hmm. The RSMS and I, were very, very conscious that the government, you know, the military government at halfway of its term was being driven by a completely new ideology. It wasn't what we started with. Not at least the means, the ends, the end was cited to us as still being there. But, you know, the means were very, very important also. Okay. It was being driven by someone else. And like I told you, that was the time I saw and I witnessed that, you know, um, Frank at the time was not being the person that I followed. But I stayed. I did not abandon that, you know. I rested with a couple of times, and that was it, you know. As a good military person, you get told what to do and you carry on. So I did. But when I later became a member of parliament, just this level of consciousness just completely overtook me. And it was taking a toll on my health. And at the time, 
when I made the decision, it was obviously motivated by something else, by an incident that happened in Cabinet. So I decided that I, you know, would call it right then because, uh, you know, for the betterment of my health. And says she, I was not well at the time. So when others say that, you know, I later came out in journey and ST, I came back. I'm, when I'm, I, I'm, I'm coming yeah. to that. Now. Okay, so I was, I remember, for you to know, yes, I was, I'm a cancer patient and I'm a cancer survivor. And I. Well, God bless you. Yeah. God bless you. You're a survivor and you're back uh, in active politics. But uh, just to go back, um, I, I heard you say that there was an incident. Uh, or, or something that happened, uh, did you say, in cabinet? And uh, that was also one of the reasons. Are you willing to share that with us? Yes, it didn't. Sorry, it did not happen in uh, cabinet. It happened in parliament. Right. You know, I was not only minister for infrastructure, but I was also the leader of the house. Yes. At the time. Okay. So it's the job that uh, Honorable Seri Ratu is performing today. Yeah, so he took the job over from me. But anyway, the short of the long story, Dr. Neil Sharma was Minister for Health. He voted with the government on the bill. Okay, and obviously then, then we were, you know, we were voting electronically, as the standing order would say, you know, if that did not work, we need to call the roll. But now we are going A and A, as you know. But that's, that's a yes. story for another day. But when he did that, when he checked out later, when the votes came out that he had voted with the opposition, obviously when you press that button, it reports, you know, sure. and your vote wherever it goes. So when he did that, obviously the, the prime minister who was there at the time, uh, the attorney general was not in Fiji. I believe he was in Australia at the time. He he was very very. Um, what do you say? He was not happy because of that decision that Neil did. So he told me, go and speak to Neil. That's what I did. I went back up to my office and I called Dr. Neil Sharma. I called him out to my office and said, hey, why did you, Prime Minister asked me to meet with you, why did you vote with the opposition? And he said, I'm a doctor because that was a medical bill. He said, my conscience told me, you know, that I have, I do not agree with what the bill is trying to do. I've forgotten now what exactly the bill is. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's why I voted with them. The short of the long, I asked, I asked uh, the Prime Minister, you know, this is the first time that he's ever done anything. No one has ever voted like that. And that he was a loyal minister in the military government. So with those factors on board, I asked the Prime Minister to give him another chance, and he said yes. And the matter rested at that. Until on the Sunday, and the Prime Minister called me and he said, well, you know, we have to meet on Tuesday morning. And then at the meeting, the Prime Minister was there, the Attorney General was there, and I was there. And so we talked about a few things, and then we talked about Dr. Neil Sharma. I've already made this story known to many people. Mm-hmm. And um, then I, when the Attorney General said to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister, we should sack uh, Dr. Neil Sharma, you know. And the reason that he gave was that, that it needs, you know, to make a lesson of him to the members of the Fiji First Caucus. So that we, you know, no one will deviate from there. And I'm telling you the truth now, you know, I'm telling you this is the honest truth. Okay. But that, that was the compelling reason that he gave for it. Okay. But when I said, I went back to my same argument. Now, obviously, the Prime Minister is the person that makes the decision. And the Prime Minister said, and you know, within his own powers, he said, no, he is going to be set. And then I said, okay, if you sack him, then I'm not going to say it because I've already forgiven him like as you said before. So I was told later, because I did not convey that message. That message was then later conveyed, um, I believe, by the whip at the time was Semi Corella of Savo, I'm told. Uh, you know, I stand to be corrected, but uh, Dr. Dr. Neil Sharma would know. Now,
that was probably the final blow, uh, you know, to me in terms of the consciousness. The voice of because, conscience. You know, yeah, voice of conscience. Because, you know, he always told us, you know, and I was a Bagabiti, Mararoya no Mukato ni Lolama. You know, make sure you have a good heart and then, you know, the heart of love. And then the heart of love for me is forgiveness, which is special to any element of growth. And he'd done it, mm -hmm. you know. And then later, you know, from where I stood, he had changed his word and his decision. I could not, um, you know, I could not endure with that. You know, I did not agree with that per se. So that was the main reason I, on the Sunday, I think it was probably on the Friday or Saturday. Okay. All right, let's leave that there. I, I appreciate it. We have a lot to cover. And uh, at the beginning, you asked me how long it would take. Um, I've got to move on, if you don't mind. So in April 2017, uh, you made a return to politics. You joined the National Federation Party. Why the National Federation Party? What was the attraction for you? The attraction for me was because, okay, the attraction was, I saw it as the political platform that wholly enabled and enshrined the vision that I had for Hiji. Something that I got inspired about Frank back in 2000 and what he fought for. Like I said, but then, then that later all changed, all those good things. But there was one, the main major reason, uh, um, Sashi, that was because Fiji First Party is a party where the decisions are retained at the top. That is no longer um, a secret. Okay, It's well known. It's out there in the public domain. And obviously that was the way the party was led, you know, by the leaders of the party, by the, by the party leader and also the general secretary. But in NFP, I saw the platform where where you know political participation could completely and wholly fulfill these aspirations that I that I was always yearning for, and that's the reason why I joined NSP. Obviously, I was very motivated at the time uh, by the uh, by the leadership of Professor Baman Prasad and the courage that he had at the time to be able to stand for what he believed uh, believed in. In June 2017, uh, you were bestowed the honor of becoming the president of the. National Federation Party. How did that uh, feel to you to be appointed in that position? When I was um, interviewed, I, you know, I, I said uh, I was completely humbled because I felt myself unworthy for that post because it was a position of was held by, you know, high and esteemed people that were unquestionable in the values that they held, which was the values of the party, particularly on the values of equality and equal rights and equal voice for everybody. But when they gave it to me, and the leader announced that uh, that they were, you know, that they would want me to consider being, uh, you know, being voted into that position, I took it as, you know, as being humbled and a great privilege, you know, to be able to to be given that great privilege, and I hold that till today. Okay, so you're once again back in the political game, and this time around you are representing the National Federation Party. The elections of 2018 come around. How difficult was it to campaign against the Fiji First Party machinery? You know, money was the difference. It was very difficult for us to support our elections campaign. We literally had to dig out from our pockets Obviously, them being in government gave them the lead. They had the initiative, but they had the resources of government to be able, you know, as in terms of the achievement. And, um, you know, their, their main supporters out there and, uh, you know, the kind of support they gave them financially is public knowledge. We did not have the same. So, you know, we have to run twice as fast to be able to beat them to the game. So that, you know, in a nutshell, you know, would uh, would sum up the difficulties that we had, and um, it continued to bug us. And you know, the oh, the opposition, you know, they actually they held on our backs until we went over and crossed the line. That's how bad it was. 
Look, uh, pork barreling is a term, and uh, for our viewers, uh, pork barreling has been described as the utilization of government funds for projects designed to please voters or legislators and win votes. Now, Mr. Thikunduandua, in the lead up to the 2018 elections, there were allegations that the government were handing out goodies, so to say, for votes. Did you and the NFP experience this? And if so, how difficult was it to combat this? Pork barreling, tell me about it. I can tell you what we told the people. Take it because that's a government assistance to you. I do not vote for them. <laughs> right. Okay. Yes. Just take it because government is giving it. Take it. Right. Obviously, like as I was referring to earlier, they always had the advantage and the initiative because they had, you know, they are running government and are able to come up with these policies. But I think any right ombudsman or any right minded institution that would look after natural justice will assume, I mean, we not even need to assume, we'll believe that is an act to buy votes per se. You know? So, we're talking about a party like NSP that is unable to give anything to the people versus, you know, a government that is going in and it is giving the people's own money to them per se. So, it was really the battle of the minds, and uh, it was not easy. But, you know, the outcomes of the election is history, Sashi. 50.2. They were yes. giving out money. You know, Minister Poya, the current minister, he was around, you know, right up to the last allowable minute to be giving money. And even that did not give him, you know, a seat first up. So, that is true. I'm history sure. tells us that indeed. Well, now, the, the so NF. Sorry, go on. No, I was just saying, I think we, like, you know, through the 360 and all this government might, you know, saying, oh, no, no, this, this and that. But what I tell you, that is, you know, they're already starting. So, all right. Now, the NFP won three seats, as we know, with the Honorable Abhiman Prasad, the Honorable Lenora, and Gerengarin Thambu, and your good self as members of parliament. How effective a voice have you three been in this current term of parliament? We've been called many things, you know. I've been assaulted. That's coming to that, yes. coming to that. Saying, if, mm. said, if you talk about how effective we were in taking government to account, I got assaulted for it. Lenora got told butter would not melt in her mouth. Biman has been called so many derogatory terms inside the house. You know, I am very proud to be a member of this team. And I got more than I asked for when I joined in terms of a kind of, you know, a kind of freedom to be able to say the things we want to say. And I can tell you, you know, we were, you know, we, we are what the opposition should be. And I think we're doing that with pride. And not only that, we are displaying a kind of, um, a kind of positive attitude and, you know, and the need for change that any government would want to do, you know, uh, when they are in power. So that's, uh, I believe, that's the effectiveness of, um, of what we are doing right now as, uh, you know, as three in the opposition. Well, it is often said that uh, when you face uh, abuse, when you face uh, derogatory terms, you must be doing something right because it's affecting some people somewhere. Um, so that stands to reason. Now, you mentioned the assault. In perhaps what has been an unprecedented uh, event in, in Fiji's history, for that matter, uh, in, in a lot of countries, in August 2019, uh, you alleged that the Prime Minister of Oringimbani Marama assaulted and threatened you after a debate. The image went viral on Facebook. What was that about? There was a debate in Parliament, and um, I believe previously on the day previous to that, um, I did not participate in that debate. But then there was a debate on the day I was assaulted. But then I 
made reference to the debate earlier on, and then I referred to the Prime Minister in the way that he attacked the Honorable Mulitao. And then later on, as the debate proceeded, it became very, very heated. And, you know, I said words like, you know, the minister should be the last person talking about, you know, violence against women and all that stuff, you know. I was, um, I was, uh, actually, I was quite angry at the time. And then, um, and uh, during the course of my speech, I made a reference to the other side of the house. But very unfortunate of me, it did not come out that way. I did not actually say in your side of the house, but then I said in the house. That's mm -hmm. what I captured. So I, I've always believed, because then I was looking at the Attorney General and uh, then, you know, he was talking to the Prime Minister. He was essentially the Prime Minister, I believe, did not really care much. And um, then a point of order was raised. And then, of course, the Prime Minister stood up and he said that I was attacking him personally and his family, which I must assure you, Sashi. And I want to reassure the Prime Minister again and his family. I did not attack them. I did not mean the Prime Minister's family. I meant the other side of the House. Obviously, the parliamentary privilege process did not agree with me. So I was, you know, supposedly found guilty in that light that I made a personal attack and that was, you know, and the rest is history. And um, obviously the Prime Minister took enough offense at that, that uh, he had to do what he did and everyone has seen the video of it where he assaulted okay. me and, and then he broke my glasses in the process. Now, a very unfortunate incident. The Prime Minister went on to apologize for his behavior. However, you refused to accept his apology. And in turn, when you refused to apologize to the Prime Minister, you were, I believe, suspended from Parliament for six months. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Firstly, why did you not forgive and sort of say forget and move on? And secondly, who determined that you ought to be suspended for six months? I'll answer the, the second question first. Sure. It was Parliament that determined... That, that made the decision for me to be um, to be suspended for six months. And that was based on the recommendation of the disciplinary committee, which is the Privileges Committee of Parliament, which I must say at the moment was completely one-sided because there was only two from the opposition. There was three from government and then obviously government was the chair in the deputy speaker. So the odds were really was stacked against me per se. Okay. So they made that recommendation that if I did not apologize to the Prime Minister, because they say that I meant the Prime Minister's house or family. And I told the house, I know what I said, I know what I meant. I did not direct those comments to the Prime Minister personally, nor his family, but to the other side of the house. And I insisted on that, Sashi. That's why I did not apologize, because I did not consider that I'd done anything wrong. But unfortunately, the ultimatum that was given to Parliament, or given to us, really, to the Prime Minister and I, apologize, or get suspended for six months, I took the six months. You stood by your principle, so to say. Yeah, well, that's what I said. That's actually the words that I said in Parliament. Now, what was your thoughts on the Privileges Committee in handing down a six-month suspension? Do you think justice prevailed? The short answer is no, it wasn't. Uh, they only made the recommendation, but Parliament, uh, Parliament, that was Parliament's call because, well, obviously, the, it was the 27 against the 20, 24. All because right. They, yeah, because they had to vote me in, and hey, I had, you know, there was no, that was it. But, you know, the process, you know, we could talk on about the process of the Privileges Committee. You know, as far as I'm concerned, it was all a fuss because it was not, yeah, you know, natural justice, as far as I'm concerned, was not said. I mean, it's just we'll, we'll leave it there. I don't want to talk about the privileges. I, I really don't want to talk about the privileges committee because yeah. uh, I feel it's privileges for some 
and not for others. So uh, let's move on. Let's just in say April, I was yes, okay. I take your point. Then in April 2020, you were arrested for sharing a video exposing brutality by Fijian police over Facebook. Now, no charges were laid against you, and the five police officers were later charged over the assault that you had exposed. What was the thought process, you think, behind your arrest? Why were you arrested? I think they were just trying to intimidate me because of comments that I made against the Prime Minister, the Minister for Defence, the Commander RSMF, and also the Commissioner of Police, full stop. They Point know taken. The law. I broke no law. All okay. I did was I pointed out the truth, and it was the truth. And as you said, people got arrested for it later, but I got punished for it. It was just to try and intimidate me, right? And when it did that, I mean, I got detained for 48 hours, up to three days, you know? I, spent mm -hmm. a, a, I was at CPS, you know, in a stinking cell. That's where they threw me in. Now, having arrested me from my home, you know, early in the morning, they could have just called me, you know, to come to Suba. I would have come. But to, you know, drag me out like a criminal from my house in my village at the sight of everybody, quite derogating, you know? Well, as you say, intimidation and uh, tactics to uh, make uh, adverse comments, I guess. Now, you and the Prime Minister go back a long, long way. Military career, as we've earlier discussed. You were so, so close and uh, I believe even spent uh, time with uh, uh, respective families. Then you had the falling out. What actually changed the dynamics? Uh, what happened? Uh, are you now on talking terms? What's your relationship today? The last time that the Prime Minister spoke to me was when he came charging at me in 2019 before he assaulted me. Mm -hmm. That was the last time he ever called me. So I do not want to repeat the things he said because that's, those are out there on the public records. And I will leave that for people to look up and whatever. But it was not good. And we've never talked again since. Okay. Now the... National Federation Party is perceived as uh, predominantly an Indo-Fijian party. What do you, as president of the party, have to say to that perception? Uh, Sashi, we are a multiracial party. At the moment, the party has a two-third Itokei and one-third uh, Indo-Fijian um, uh, representative in parliament. We are for everybody. Um, and um, I know that we are working very hard to gain the confidence, particularly of the Indo-Fijian people. And um, we are naturally that. Our aspirations and our vision and our values have not changed since day one. And those, those principles are clear to you. And, um, and they talk about the very nature of democratic principles, which, you know, and, in, and, and that is to, to make sure that, you know, the people, it is the people who actually, you know, the people actually have a say in the running of their government, you know, in, in, particularly in the laws and uh, how the laws are to be determined. And that seems to be, and right now, right now, that seems to be the focus of our work, the focus of our work, you know, to tell the government that what they're doing is undemocratic and, you know, we're pointing out the light to them, you know. So we've not held in that, but we are, we are a multiracial party. We, we, we are not. We're not an Indian party. Okay, now let's move to some current issues. Mr. Tikundundua, you were the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport in the Fiji First Government. Let us look at the current dilemma. There are water and power cuts almost daily. Where do you think the problem lies and what should be done? The problem lies in two areas, um, uh, Sashi. One, I'll be very honest, um, as a former minister, our infrastructure, particularly water, is really, really old. And I acknowledge the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of work has been put into it, and I recognize the dedication of the people that are trying to do it now. The problem, though, is, in my view, is the will of the government to be able to look at it and listen to alternative views in terms of how these issues can be resolved amicably. Because it's only being taken right now as a matter of you know, availability of money. 
there are many other things that the people can participate in. You know, uh, and then um, right now, you know, our roads are in a mess. Water cuts are never ending. I just read out in Parliament the other day a parliamentary report that noted so many schools that do not have running water. You know, I'm just um, those problems, despite what government has given in the last. I mean, I've left the, the minister's job for seven years. You know, I want to say right now that you know, from the time I think we've gone backwards in terms of the state of the infrastructure, we have absolutely gone backwards. Let me try and put a photograph on screen uh, right now. Uh, let me do that now. I wonder whether you can see that photograph, sir. I can can you see, see that it. photograph now? Have you ever seen a road like this in Fiji? I mean, uh, you know, for goodness sake, there seems to be a huge problem if one has to drive on roads like this. Uh, earlier, I tried to contact my friend Mahesh uh, Mesuria in uh, Levuka, I believe this is a photograph from Levuka. Um, have you ever seen a road like this in Fiji? Shashi, this road almost looks like uh, the road leading to my house after a big rain. <laughs> so, uh, right. you, know, you, are, you know, I would not blame myself if I thought that was actually the road, you know, apart from the sea there in the background. But I can tell you, I recognize that road. Yes. A house right next to the road. That is the residence in Levuka of the um, of the Douglas family, between um, um, who are these two? Uh, Waitovu and Wangandazi. That's the stretch there is. Yeah. And um, yeah, what you see there, um, and, and, and yeah. So when you when you look at a road like that, and you've just described. Yeah, yeah. And you've just described that that could be a road just outside your house as well. That's right. Where, that's in that's in yeah, and, and where do we point the finger then? Well, ultimately, the Fiji Roads Authority is the, or the authority that is ultimately responsible for roads in law. The government is ultimately responsible, and of course, the minister is responsible. Yeah. Um, that's the only way we are pointing. I mean, there's no other way to point. It is their job and they must fix the road. I really, really feel for the people of Fiji in terms of infrastructure, basic necessities, water, electricity, uh, infrastructure like roads. It, it is just uh, horrendous to think about it. Let me move towards the concept of uh, democracy, Mr. Tikundundua. I have asked this question to all of my guests, and uh, you are no exception. I'd like to ask you this. Is there fear of reprisal in the people in Fiji? Is, are the people in Fiji scared to speak? The short answer to that, people in Fiji are not speaking. Very few are speaking. Okay. Motivated by a whole lot of reasons, one of which is fear. Okay. Some, some people, because of what they are getting, are not necessarily speaking because they fear that they might lose these things, even though they disagree with the government per se. Some have fear, obviously, because of the history of how people, you know, how people were treated back then, you know, for raising their voices openly, and that's in recorded history. So, but I would say many uh, do not openly share their opinion uh, about what is happening with the government or democracy, so to speak, is, I mean, even the newspapers, per se, uh, because of the threat. I mean, you know, for the media, there is the media, the MIDA, you know? You've got to be writing a story and be worried whether, you know, is this going to be perceived or, you know, assessed as being, you know, breaking the law. So there is no freedom, per se, in terms of, you know, uh, full freedom for the press to be able to say this thing. So, Yes, definitely there is fear. Without doubt, there is fear. Okay, I'm going to come back to the media in a moment. Why? Why would uh, the average uh, ordinary citizen have a fear to speak their mind? I think it is the experience of many at the hands, you know, of the government 
you know, because of their um, disagreement with the different, uh, this includes the military government, particularly during the time of the military government, and to a lesser extent, you know, to the term of the first government, uh, you know, after 2014, raised this perception about um, when you, you, you say something that, you know, the police or the military will come for you and arrest you and take you. Obviously, you know, I mean, you see the incident in uh, um, in India that you had referred to when I was arrested. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if that can happen to me, a member of parliament, per se, what do you think a common citizen would, would feel? You know? Good point. Yes. Very good point. Yeah. But All right. I, yes. That is looking less and less because people, you know, you know, an army marches on its stomach. The best way to a man's head, you know, to a man's love is through his stomach. It is the stomach that's telling. And when your family is hungry, people no longer fear. You know. People All right. No now, I'm, I'm happy to have got you back. We seem to be having some internet issues, perhaps intermittent uh, connections, but uh, you're back on, so which is wonderful. You mentioned uh, the media. Um, the, the, the media in Fiji, well, some of them, not all, uh, seem to be uh, afraid to freely express themselves in Fiji. And, and you mentioned uh, Maida, for instance. Uh, uh, how, how does one instill confidence in the media organizations in Fiji to report freely without fear of recrimination? Well, first of all, get rid of might I change the law. That would be a good start, you know, and just let the media, just let the media do its job. There's too many oaks, yokes, you know, being put in conditions around all of this. There seems to be an answer that, you know, our media is not fair, uh, talking about there is a line to NST, a line to opposition and whatnot. But I tell you what, without an independent media, there is no democracy. There is no democracy. We do not have an independent media in Fiji. And I mean independent in the sense that they do not have the full freedom to be able to express freely the will of the people. Okay. And uh, that is why this program was established. Uh, because, uh, as I said right at the beginning, Fijians want to know. They want answers. And uh, we've set this forum up uh, so people like your good selves can appear in the program, uh, face up to questions, and uh, answer freely uh, as to uh, what is the real situation in Fiji. Let me move uh, to a part of the Constitution now and uh, discuss the Constitution, particularly with Section 131.2, which says that it shall be the overall responsibility of the Republic of the Fiji Military Forces to ensure at all times the security, defense, and well-being of Fiji and all Fijians. Do you have any qualms about this section of the Constitution? And can this section that may uh, can this section be used perhaps to allow for another interference or coup in Fiji? Should there be a change in government? I think it's probably one of the most, the more controversial aspects and provisions of the constitution. Okay. And um, what you said later is part of your question in terms of can, can that be used? That is the biggest fear that people have in terms of what it implies. Okay. We talk about full command of the military as stated that earlier which means that most of these powers really rest on the commander. There has not been any occasion where that well-being has been defined. So the people's fears have not been alleviated. So you can't really blame the people for believing what they believe it to be. Now, of course, many experts, legal experts, have said that that provision in terms of welfare does not give the military a right to intervene and remove a legally appointed government. Okay. But that fear has never been alleviated. I have raised it in Parliament. We at NSP have raised it in the concerns. The opposition parties have raised it. 
but we have not received a clear answer per se to say that you know that this does not mean that the RSMF can again you know conduct take over a fairly and a legally appointed government through the provisions of 1312 using the word uh, the well-being of the nation it is the biggest question that is hanging in it. I tell you, Sashi, that needs to be cleared. It needs to be cleared as soon as possible by those in power and those that wrote that constitution. Well, I hope in the next uh, couple of weeks or so to have a legal expert on the program. And uh, I will raise this uh, from a totally a, a legalistic point of view and, and get a legal view on that. Uh, now... Mr. Tikundundua, you are a former military man. Let me ask you the same question that I asked last week. In the budget estimates for 2021-2022, the RFMF have been allocated uh, $79.7 million, and I stand to be corrected on that. Given the state of the economy, given the state uh, of the country in terms of its socioeconomic standing, the poverty level, high rate of unemployment, poor deteriorating health services and many, many, many problems. Why do you think there's uh, such a need for such an allocation? Uh, why, why does the military need such an um, amount of money? Is there an impending threat from somewhere? Why would we need that sort of expenditure when infrastructure, uh, uh, hospitals, etc., they're all just going down the drain? Shashi, I think uh, I will tell you my honest answer. Yes, that please level do. of funding, you know, from a mm. former military person and my understanding of strategy and my understanding of the history behind the involvement of RSMF and why this same sum of money or seems to be increasing all the time is given to the RSMF because I believe, you now I'm telling you, I'm believing that this kind of support that it is given really wholly is to be able continue to keep them in the good books of the government per se and the current leadership per se that is the honest my honest belief and i will stand by that okay now the rsms the professional institution um you know um obviously requires there is a role for them in the constitution and they have to perform that obviously to the public as well but I will also, you know, uh, remind government of the fact that, you know, and also, you know, my colleagues, and I've always said I log ahead with RSMF in this sense, because, you know, uh, looking at viewing professionalism and responsibility and sacrifice, you know, um, that the force in itself must also exercise this, um, you know, a real look at its self-responsibility or responsibly in light of their role in terms of the well-being you know of the force so one of the things that really exacerbated the uh, the rsmf budget per se is that peacekeeping allocation which is a separate allocation other than the operating uh, budget of the force now we the government gives us this excuse that we need to maintain this presence overseas in terms of uh, peacekeeping. Okay. Now, you know, in the past, peacekeeping used to look after itself. We are a small nation. We hear these, uh, you know, the, the government ministers say, you know, we're punching above our own weight. We have yes. no, we have no weight. The economy is saying we have no weight. But how can we be supporting, you know, peacekeeping efforts to run the world when our own people are also, you know, they also need those funds at home? You know, it seems that, you know, the government continues to go, and they mentioned this last week when we were debating the foreign affairs report, that we continue to look at new visions. But I think it should not come at the cost of Indian people. The UN must pay. The US needs to pay. Australia must pay. It should not come out of the poor taxpayers of Fiji who continue to carry this. Obviously, the professionalism of the soldiers is unquestionable. But can we as a nation afford it? Does the RSMF okay. think it is right? 
These are the questions that need to be examined. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, the Thinking People's Programme. We ask the questions that Fijians all over the world need answers to. Let me tell you, no lasu or jhut here. What you see is what you get straight from the horse's mouth, so to say. My guest on Sashi Singh's Talking Point this afternoon is the Honourable Pio Tikunduandua. Now, let me ask you about Fiji's Parliament. This week, the Parliament Standing Order 51 has been in the news a lot. Now, let me, to my viewers, give them a by way of background. Let me state that uh, in the good old days of uh, parliamentary democracy in Fiji, if a minister wanted to introduce a bill, he or she would inform the Secretary-General to the Parliament, give a 21-day notice before the first reading of the bill in the House, and then the bill to be gazetted for 30 days before introduction. That was the timeline that used to be followed in the, as I say, the good old days of parliamentary democracy. However, many people have expressed their grave concerns about the use and abuse of Standing Order 51 in the House. Standing Order 51 allows Parliament to vote to bypass the usual stages of considering a bill, which is a draft law, and instead to vote on it without delay. This week, three bills have been passed under Standing Order 51. Mr. Tikunduandua, what can you say about Standing Order 51, and do you think it is being abused by the current government? I mean, how do MPs read, read and digest three bills in a space of uh, two days, I guess, or less than that? Standing Order 51, I believe, is the cause of the biggest commotions in the House. Um, <clears throat> The contention behind Standing Order 51 is that it gives the mover of the motion to dictate or determine the terms on which that law is going to be passed. So if he says, like this last one, 12 hours, table at 10 o'clock in the evening, and it'll be debated at 9 in the morning and passed the same day after one hour of debate. That's, I mean, compare that to the old um, uh, process. And, our argument has always been because Standing Order 51 takes away the right of the people to be consulted in the, in the processing of this law, in the lead up before it is passed. This is the biggest problem. And then it should only be used if there was something really, really urgent by Parliament and everyone agrees that that needs to be useful, a national emergency of some sort. Yes. But I can tell you, 90% of the laws that have gone through since Parliament set came through Standing Order 51. You know, with the terms dictated by the Attorney General, who is the only person that is tabling the bills, or the amendment of the new bills, the new laws. He determines how long they are. Sometimes they go to business, to the uh, Standing Committee, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's a few days, sometimes it's a few months. But it's always been the issue about the law eventually is going to affect the people. They must have a say in that. This is the, our biggest concern about Standing Order 51, and it has been used and abused by the government. And I've said this publicly in Parliament, and I'm saying it again now. This provision of the Standing Order must change. You know, it must change. It, there's no... You know, there must be conditions around what what certain bills can use Standing Order 51 to be passed through the House. Obviously, I agree. I mean, as the Speaker said the other day, the communications is now getting better. But I tell you, there is no, like Premier said in the House, oh, we, you know, intelligent enough, we do not have to consult or whatnot. It's ridiculous. You know, you can say that... Uh, you can't say that. It's our job to talk to the people. So consultation, telling the people, getting the people involved, is the main reason why we have always objected to this law. And it must well, go, go. Well, when a member of parliament says we don't have to consult, uh, that is uh, arrogance. You are there to serve the people of Fiji and not your self-interest. Moving on 
Mr. Tikundundua, what are your views on the conduct of the Speaker, uh, particularly on the use of Standing Order 51? And uh, as you said, let me call a spade a spade, the abuse of Standing Order 51. That is correct. My, I had heard in Parliament my, uh, my view uh, in terms of the role of the Speaker with regards to Standing Order 51. I think the Speaker has a role to be able to hold the government into account. There are certain times when we in the opposition feel, you know, we feel this, we believe that the way that our issues have been put into the parliament and the way that tables have fixed it and the way that, you know, the office of the speaker has um, dealt with our matters, you know, you know, we, you know, we can be, you know, um, we perceive this bias, you know, we perceive this bias and we are speaking out against it, you know. So what, what I'm saying, you know, I've already, um, um, I'm, 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 I'm saying here though that, you know, we, you know, we feel the way we feel, you know, and, um, and that I think the role of the speaker in the standing orders is quite clear. Um, my issue in terms of, uh, you know, my views about that, I had already echoed in the house and, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, the people can uh, go and check those links, you know. All right. Now, um, at times, uh, it seems that uh, as much as they may try, despite the members of uh, Parliament on the opposition benches making valid arguments and or replies, it seems they all fall on deaf ears. How would you describe the day-to-day -day activities in Parliament? Well, it's definitely theatric. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's very hard for the opposition to, you know, to influence anything, at least any government vote on any matter. None of our motions, you know, has ever passed through Parliament with the government agreed to anything at all. That's the level of communications in the House. And, you know, um, the Attorney General mentioned what, that, you know, that that we are far apart in the way that, you know, in terms of our principles and everything, that, you know, they do not see a reason to be talking to us or communicating with us as we were requesting, like a Parliament would do. But um, it is uh, a mountain, you know, for the opposition to be able to raise anything. And unfortunately, you know, for instance, some people do not understand the functions of the business committee where things, you know, matters that are being raised to us, we raise at the business committee, cannot reach the floor of parliament because we could never have a consensus, you know, on these matters. There is always argument again. So, for instance, in the last sitting, three of our motions were, were not allowed, one written question and one oral question. That's, um, that's the bottom line, you know. Um, That's the ruling of the speaker. No, that is not the ruling of the like the, the the speaker. Okay, we like in the last business committee we did not contend the speaker's decision that came through tables in terms of those motions that we that were disagreed. Okay. So they came back with an explanation in the business committee. I just said we do not agree with your assessment of it. Okay, and we do not agree with the outcome that you reached. So we put out a media statement to that as well, you know, noting our opposition in terms of what the speaker had ruled. So, um, and as I said also in Parliament, we disagree all the time, you know, we disagree all the time. All right, I, I know I had given you a time frame. I still have a few questions to go. And uh, some of those answers, they don't have to be an in-depth answer. So uh, hopefully I can get to it without uh, taking too much of your time. Now, uh, you mentioned Parliament, a lot of theatrics. Uh, it's supposed to be an august body, the supreme leg legislative body in Fiji. Sometimes it seems that things are not right. Take, for example, a small example. I believe that the seating arrangements were changed this week for you, you members. Um, you know, what sort of unnecessary action is this? 
who decided to change the seating order and start uh, playing musical chairs? Isn't there far more important matters on the agenda for the country? Well, you know, the leader was sitting as part of the inner bench. Lenore and I were seated immediately behind her. So we've moved one, two, three. Biman has moved three, two, three places back. Sorry, two places back. Lenora and I, Len I, will, I have moved one place back and Lenora has moved three places back. So we are tucked away in that corner of the gallery. So when camera comes into Parliament, you will never see us because we are kind of under the, you know, um, there's a bit of a shelter there. And uh, how we got there is definitely not from the opposition. We had no say in it. and. Um, um, but it was the decision of the office of the speaker in the way that that was seated. So, and, uh, All right, they, they play musical chairs. Now, you are a par parliamentarian, as we all know. How would you describe the behavior on the government side? It has been noted, and I stand to be corrected, uh, that, that only a handful of government members actually speak on any given day. The rest are quite mute. Is this true? Would that be a true account? Well, there are two that always talk. We always call the other 25 the silent 25. Yes, uh, somebody did put a comment on, uh, on, on, on comment section, the silent 25. Keep going. Yeah, so um, that is our perception about the others. Obviously, government does not agree. But uh, there are set speakers. I mean, government allows itself, you know, how many speakers it wants. But, um, you know, we... Uh, I know over there that, you know, there are only a restricted number of speakers per se, so that's how they handle their, you know, their job. All right. My next question to you is, there have been expressions in many, many quarters that corruption and nepotism is rife in government. What are your views on this? Is this a fact or a figment of people's imagination? Well, this is, you know, from what people view and they perceive it to be. Obviously, the onus is on the government to make sure that these perceptions are clear, you know. But there are also, you know, certain allegations of certain practices, you know, where, you know, corruption um, and nepotism has occurred. And um, uh, those uh, have been raised, you know, um, you know, through the media and, um, you know, uh, you're talking about people, uh, that have been appointed to board. Like, I mean, we've been hopping about this. Um, you know, the, um, the main funders of CG First, you know, are, you know, are represented in some of the government boards, per se. We continue to question the validity of that. You know? Okay. Whatever that means, you know, the people point at it. And it is perceived in a particular way, you know, but as you know, like the determinant, you know, that people have very little access to be able to raise this issue and that to allow, you know, for that to take its course to determine whether it's actually corrupt or not. That is, uh, that is the concern. Okay. Um, you are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, the Thinking People's Program, coming your way live on Facebook uh, from Sydney, Australia with our chief guest this afternoon, the Honorable Pio Tikunduandua. Now, sir, let me shift the subject to human rights abuses. There have been reported cases in the past where the military have been implicated in gross human rights abuses. Earlier, I spoke about the chain of command. Whose call is it normally when civilians are marched into camp for questioning or interrogation? Where does that order come from? Because first, if we talk about uh, these allegations of abuse, mm -hmm. you know, people just don't make wild allegations about things that happen to them. And they are publicly recorded in many places. Uh, I'm not going to mention names, but I think they are familiar to you in terms of, you know, alleged victims of uh, these events. That is, why I use the word that is why I use the word allegation. We don't want right. to name names. Yes. They are allegations per se, you know. Sure. But I, I will go further to say that, you know, Allegations just don't pop up out of nowhere. 
In terms of the allegation that the military did, because I mean, our soldiers just don't take, you know, they just don't do things willy nilly. You know, the chain of command is clear. Um, it's obviously, you know, it's within the military, you know, soldiers just don't go and do things. Some form of delegation, you know, occurs. Where that comes from, you know, is, you know, that, that is, um, that, that needs to be determined. But there is no doubt in terms of how, you know, command and, uh, you know, is exercised, you know, um, 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 in the military with regards to any, any kind of operational metal decisions where the soldiers are involved. All right. I mean, in the same token, I mean, who is it that decides to strip women to their panties and bras and to strip men to their underwears, um, as, as, as has been reported in the past? Someone's got to make that call because, as you say, a soldier won't just nilly, uh, nilly willy do that. Uh, if I was uh, running a company and if I was doing uh, a bad uh, job in a public company, the board of directors would remove me. Yeah, it is truly a matter of concern when those allegations are noted in the way that you are saying, you know. And some element of responsibility needs to be taken. And unfortunately, to this time when we are talking, um, yeah, it remains to be seen, you know. Well, as you said, uh, somebody in the top has to make that decision to carry out such atrocious acts. True? Yes, no? Oh, that is correct, yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. I'll say now, yes to that. Now, do you think our discussing this is sensitive, uh, uh, that we we're touching on a sensitive subject? Well, it is sensitive enough. I'm going to carry it away. So. Uh, oh. <laughs> I hope I don't pose you any risk. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, it's okay. I mean, you know, I've been taken in a few times. You know, I, I've said things here that many will not be happy about. So, well, as they say, the as they we say, we move, move on. Yes, yes, sure, of course, I have moved on, you know, it's just that. Okay. But this, now, uh, this issue, though, that you are saying, continues to linger in people's mind, and it's ultimately the responsibility of the government to alleviate the people's perception of fear, and that justice must be done. Now, with all due respect to you, Mr. Tikunduandua, have you ever been involved in any such activities, these atrocious acts? No, no, I have never. I have Thank never you. Anyone. No. All right. Thank you. Um, now, let's look at uh, the people on Struggle Street. It has been documented that a government minister recently stated that no one is struggling in Fiji. I repeat, no one is struggling in Fiji. You know, and I know, and if you read the letters to the editor columns here in the newspapers, even the Fijian people know that 30% of Fiji's population is living bef below the poverty line. You are in Parliament. Is it truly the case of some people in Parliament being completely clueless about the real plight of ordinary Fijians' daily struggle? Are some people so obli uh, oblivious to the pain, suffering and poverty that can be seen in the light of day at any time in Fiji. I don't know how many set of ways this government has or, you know, um, or the cause of the denial of the level of poverty in Fiji and the state of our economy. Because I tell you what I said, I told you earlier, Sashi, people feel it in their stomach. And that cannot be challenged. Okay? So I don't know the, the minister that made that. I'm not sure he's living in what planet. Maybe in Utopia or somewhere. He may, I mean, he's definitely not living in Fiji. But if that minister lived in, lives in Fiji, then that minister is blind and does not hear, you know, to be able to see what is happening on the ground. When the reality is what exactly is you have said. The figures are clear. The percentage of our people that live below poverty line. It was going down in 2009, and then it's been exacerbated by COVID. And, you know, it's people feel it every day. 
unemployment, you know, all of that is here, you know, wages, um, nothing changes for the people. So if someone is denying that nothing is happening, like that he's saying here in Fiji, he's not living in this country, definitely not on this planet. Okay, now I'm going to take you to this next subject and uh, perhaps give you a chance to clarify because uh, there seems to be some doubts expressed. Now, and this is in regards to the Hindu temple desecration. Recently, there were, I believe, two incidents of desecration of uh, Hindu temples. One was in uh, Baulevu. Now, under the 2013 constitution, sacrilege against any religion is uh, deemed to be a criminal offence. At the time of this uh, sacri sacrilege uh, act that took place, you are quoted to have said that uh, oh, you apparently attacked the Attorney General for condemning the act as a criminal act without evidence. You are quoted as saying that there was no proof that the break-in at Baolevu Hindu Temple was done by criminals. My question to you, sir, is, if the Constitution defines the act as criminal, where is the dispute? Was this not a criminal act? I mean, I'd like you to clarify your statements. What were you actually trying to say in relation to this incident? Let me start by saying, Sashi, I condemn and I deplore. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt about that, the act that was committed in Bolivar. Full stop. There is no doubt on that. My issue with the Attorney General is the issue is that he politicized that particular incident and made it an issue about 1987. Quoting 1987 uh, in part of his release. Now, what he, what he did eh, was he completely took that event and then turned it into a political football game. Right? And trying to take political advantage of that. That was my, um, that was my concern at that issue. Like I said, I condemn the issue. It must never happen. Because okay. this has happened in a number of times. I can tell you for sure. Well, the investigations have not been conclusive, but then the same labeling has not been done. And so, you know, I call on the police to complete the investigation so that the people who did that sacrilegious thing, you know, and um, they burnt the holy book, you know, people must be, they must front the law. They must be accountable for that. But politicians, like the Attorney General, should not politicize it, you know? It's, there was no need for it. Okay. I accept your clarification. Let's move on towards uh, elections uh, and uh, or, or the Fiji First Party for now. You are in opposition. How do you think the government has failed the people of Fiji if you think they have? <clears throat> the... Um the people of Fiji, sorry, the government, our current government has failed the people of Fiji in every way. I will start first with what is foremost and the most important thing for me, and that is genuine equality under the law. Same opportunity for everybody, you know, the, the aspirations for human rights and the free media. Those things have never been fully achieved. They promised those through the law. I can tell you we are completely in a different state now. The state of our health affairs is atrocious. Our roads and water and public utility is all cuts every day. The roads are in a mess. People don't have drinking water. Dialysis is in a sham. The schools, our education policy, I mean, I tell you, this government needs to go. Fijians deserve better. All right. Now, as the country heads uh, towards the forthcoming elections, what challenges are there in terms of the electoral process and, and the actual elections? Certain legislations were changed, you know, um, understanding Order 51. You know, 
particularly registration um, of voters, women voters. You know, they have to change their name to to their maiden name if they are married. Um, changes to polling stations, voter registration card. Okay, <clears throat> now our concern has that been the biggest injustice that could happen to this is the people who are waiting out there to be registered to exercise their right to vote for their government will not be able to do so because the, capacity, the office of the supervisor of elections is unable to register people in time. And so I'm asking them to do this. I know they said they've already started going out, but I tell you, they should go out in a big way. I know people in Ra, in Northern Telebu, and I'm sure it's like said everywhere. People are waiting to have their, to change their cards, but um, the opportunity must be given, it needs to be done now. All right, now, as I said, moving towards the elections, uh, there have been suggestions that the National Federation Party and the People's Alliance Party, and Mr. Rambuka has made mention, I think, in the last day or so, that uh, you'll join as coalition partners. There was a similar approach in 1999 between Mr. Rambuka's then party and the NFP, and the results were disastrous. The NFP got annihilated. What will be different this time? Well, for starters, Rambuka is not the same person that people perceive it to be, and it's really, really sad that, uh, that it continues to be used as a political tool. I think he's already apologized to the people of Fiji, and I'm talking about him here as a person, and um, uh, that we will continue to be perceived in that way. But uh, one thing, though, Sashi, the National Federation Party, um, we have a history with Rambuka for a good measure. And that is in the 1997 constitution. Mm -hmm. And we still say that is the best constitution because you know what? The difference is that that was the constitution that the people wanted. It was done, consulted. People were consulted in a consultative process. And it was what the people wanted. Yeah. And of course, as you know, uh, history, um, we know that had removed it. But we work, you know, our... Uh, our relationship with him goes back then. He has formed his own party. Obviously, NFP uh, is a small party. We, we we value partnership, and we're talking to all. You know, we speak to everybody. You know, all of the political parties. We've been, you know, talking to other parties: Labour, Freedom Party, um, also um, uh, Marumba's Unity. Uh, and we're all at different levels of accomplishment. Okay? But we are committed in terms of uh, working uh, with the People's Alliance Party, you know, before the elections. And uh, he's already made that aware that we are working together. And I'll keep at that. Uh, at the moment, that agreement has not been formalized. Hopefully, that might be something that we need to do in the not too distant future. You mentioned that uh, Mr. Sithiveni Rambuka is not the same person that he was uh, years and years ago. Now, there are some segments of the Indo-Fijian community that have still not forgiven Mr. Rambuka for the atrocities that took place after the coup of 87. Is there a concern that your party's alliance with the People's Alliance Party may lose you some Indo-Fijian votes along the way? So, see, that is always a concern. Okay. And... Um, those who are victims then and who feel that way, we we have to respect that that's how they feel. And I respect that too. Okay. But life goes on. Um, uh, Rambuka is the biggest Itoke leader in Fiji, the biggest political leader. It stands like a mountain in front of you, in front of us. You cannot avoid that. You need to talk. You need to talk to that problem and to that leadership. And that's what we are doing. Yes, we don't forget um, things like that just don't get forgotten. But you don't carry it on yourself all the time. You want to move forward for the sake of our nation. And, and uh, like I said, we were back 
We have a history with Rambuka back in the 1997 for that constitution. And then it's the same thing now. All right. You mentioned uh, there are talks going on with the Labour Party, Mr. Narumbe's uh, Unity, Fiji Party, etc. Do you think there's uh, room for a grand alliance of parties in Fiji in, in a concerted effort, in a concerted move to oust the incumbent government? Or do you think it will be a political nightmare to join forces? <laughs> Why do you laugh? Well, I'm... I'm um, I understand the reality of yes. the situation in Fiji. The law does not allow for coalitions prior to the elections, only after the election had been declared, as you know. So we can only talk with each other in terms of, uh, uh, you know, working together. There are instances where, you know, political leaders uh, have resigned from their party and gone on to join another platform. So um, this, this uh, right now, in terms of our discussion with those parties that you mentioned, um, have not quite reached a conclusion whereby to suggest that this, this whole grand coalition of parties is going to be uh, the thing that happens in 2022. We are saying already that NFP, we've identified ourselves with People's Alliance Party. So, the only thing I would say is that I would like to ask the others to make up their mind, you know, to come and join us on this condition. I respect your views now, Mr. Tikundu, as we head towards the finish line. Let me explore the man, you the man, and, and your thoughts on the following. In your maiden speech in Parliament in 2014, while a member of Parliament for the Fiji First Party, you said, we have a vision for Fiji of inclusiveness, of us finally achieving our promise as a nation, that we have our sets, uh, our sights set on the future, and especially for our young people. Eight years on, I ask you, is there inclusiveness in Fiji, or is the country and its people divided on any number of issues? I've seen said in Parliament that this, this country is divided, has never been divided before. Inclusivity is something that someone must believe that they are. That they are included in the general vision of where things, you know, where the nation is heading. That they have a say in it. You know, I'm giving you examples where people are not being consulted. It is not something that you declare. Okay? It is something you aspire to but must involve the human person so that they take ownership of it. And unfortunately, you know, the idea is great. The execution is a failure. And unfortunately, Fiji has gone backwards. No matter what government is saying, and I can tell you for sure, we have to work hard at our unity. The unity of the people. The unity of people of Fiji. The unity of all Fijians. All right, uh, you may have answered my next question. And my next question is that, uh, w w what or rather, how is the overall situation in Fiji with regards to the young people? Because remember, you had said uh, uh, there was going to be an emphasis on young people. Ha have the lives of uh, the young people improved or worsened? I think you've answered that uh, under the current government, things have gone worse. But I just wanted uh, you to touch on that. Okay, I'll, I'll answer your question this way. Government has put out, I mean, as far as the young people are concerned, these two things that probably they want to be concerned education and employment. Okay. Both areas have not been fully met in that regard. The certain initiatives in terms of the scholarships, yes, I take that. Um, even though now after COVID, those assistances uh, have been reduced dramatically. Okay opportunity to pursue education per se. But I tell you, uh, uh, Sashi, it's so much more than that. It is the freedom to exercise, for the youth to exercise their liberty now, so that they, not the government, can shape their future tomorrow. Okay? 
the youth that has to be today, not tomorrow, that has to be today. So they are going, the youth have a big say, and I can tell you, I mean, I've been speaking to this, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. The majority of that is youth, or youthful people. And I can tell you, the general consensus out there is there is a whole lot of concern, but, um, you know, uh, like I say, you know, change is all it needs for so that holistic um, uh, approach, or a holistic outcome, not only piecemeal, but with the development of the youth, you know, completely, so that they can enjoy a life of being used in a very democratic state. All right. Uh, I, I hope your internet connection improves uh, very quickly. Now, uh, what is your message to the viewers today? What is your message to the electorate, Mr. Tikundundua? Thank you, sir. Um, I thank you, uh, thank you, first, for this opportunity to talk to the people. Fiji cannot go backwards. It needs to go forward. Fiji needs a government and the ideology that leads our nation into the nation that we all want is, um, is something that we have yet to achieve. We need good leaders. And that is essentially um, what the opposition is offering to the people. You know, um, the political parties are going to be putting up their candidates for the next election. And I hope that the people will not, you know, on the last minute, because of some fear, or because of, uh, you know, goodies that they get, you know, will sacrifice their liberty and freedom as, as you know, as citizens of a democratic country like Fiji. So to, to be able to exercise that, they cannot have this government, not under these laws. You need a new set of brain and a new set of visions to actually make the equality, you know, for Fiji and the aspirations for a free and a democratic place to live. All right, now, Mr. Tuk, uh, Tikundundua, I've got uh, just uh, a little bit more um, before you say goodbye. And to our <laughs> viewers, I just, I just want to say this, uh, okay. that uh, don't switch off just uh, when Mr. Tikundundua finishes. Stay around because I'm about to reveal who is our chief guest for next week. Now, okay. sir, I understand that as a kid, all you wanted to be was a truck driver. And uh, then you rose through the ranks of the RFMF to become a lieutenant colonel. You moved into government to become a permanent secretary for two different portfolios. Entered parliament as a member of uh, parliament. You became a minister, currently in the opposition as a member of parliament. Four questions. And uh, first one, what do you have to say about your professional life's journey so far? A blessed journey? It's been very, very fulfilling, particularly the last two and a half years. Very, very fulfilling. Um, I've been able to be myself, to speak openly about what I believe, and to stand up for what I believe. And, um, and, and I have never been so proud to be a member of LSP and been given that opportunity to be, to exercise that freely in an environment of support and an environment I believe that is best for Fiji. Yeah. Okay, now, second question. What does life have in store for Pio Tikundu and Dua now? Well, I can say now I will be, well, hopefully I don't, you know, I don't get sick for some reason in between that I will not be able to contest the elections. But, uh, I will be my intention. Uh, I have already applied for an NSP ticket, like everyone else. We all have to do that. So, uh, if my application for uh, you know for candidate is accepted, then I will be standing in the 2022 elections. And um, beyond the, that election, only time will tell. I, you know, I have a planning place, a planning plan in place. All right. Uh, I'll wait. I'll wait for that cunning plan to be revealed uh, sometime. Third yeah. question: What is your vision for Fiji now? I just want a nation of free people, 
free to exercise, to speak their language, to live in security in their home without worry, to know that their neighbor has got their back. You know, to hear that, uh, that, that, the polit- that they be able to overcome the politics of separation and fear. That we can live all as one and one community and be proud of who we are, but also respect the others who are not like us. That is, that is the CGI I want. You know, like I'm talking to you now, telling you these things, not many are going to say this to be able to speak like this because then you know we all know i mean it's perceived by people you do not want that perception in your head you know i want to be like someone you know in downtown sydney you know like go up to yes. Park and then say something put some play card and say i don't like this and then you know who is my elected councillor i mean now they do not elect councillors for our local government we want that back those are the voice of the people. Let the people be the center again of how we lead our nation. Yes, the law is good, but the law must be fair and just. But it's well always said. people. Always about the people. Well, before I get to my last question, uh, I sincerely hope that uh, what uh, you've spoken about so freely today doesn't get you into any strife because that will upset me. Uh, You know, you've volunteered to come on the program, you've spoken openly and freely, and uh, I always believe that, uh, you know, these subjects need to be raised with people like your good self, who are in Parliament, etc., and, uh, you know, you you call the shots as you see it, so I certainly hope that uh, you don't get into any strife, that's my sincere hope. And now, yeah, go on. Let me just say this. I came to your your interview with wise eyes open, with two eyes wide open. All my senses are open, meaning that I come here on my own free choice. I know that um, the kind of questions, but the truth is what the people deserve. Nothing less. Nothing less. And I'm going to tell the truth. And then, you know, for whatever it means, but that's not on you. Well, let the people be the judge. Whatever happens to me is a matter that is beyond my control because someone needs to make that call. Well, sir, as I, as, as, as I said uh, earlier, this program is all about Fijians all over the world want to know. They need answers. And uh, my, my last question to you, and uh, you need to concentrate on this one. Um, how is your Twitter experience going? I believe... You had a great, great time getting used to Twitter. It is the biggest discovery of my life. Let me say that. <laughs> How does a gray-haired guy like me, who's 55 going on 56, try to relate to young people? I find it very hard relating on issue negotiating with my own son, who's 24, and my daughter, who's 22. Can you imagine that? Yes. But I'm proud. <laughs> but I am very, very thankful that the Twitter, but the Twitter universe has been very, very accommodating and very, very. I have learned so much from the members themselves, and I appreciate the way that they have uh, guided me through the tweet process. And I am officially an OG, not an old girl, as you know. Yes. Yes, I am officially an OG. So every time I note that, and it's because it is acknowledged officially, and I I value the time and what I put on Twitter. I know many, many, I think my following is close to 8,000 people now. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful way of relating openly. And, um, you know, I've used the dialogue sessions on it and... Um, I can tell you one thing, though, Sashi, that um, my um, my talkbacks on Twitter, you know, captures the largest audience in Fiji, and I think I should do that soon. All right. Well, uh, for those like my dear old mother, who doesn't know what OG is, uh, Mum, it's uh, original gangster, Mr. Peel. 
<laughs> Mr. Pio Tikundu, a member of parliament and president of the National Federation Party, thank you very, very much for being my chief guest uh, in Sashi Singh's talking point this afternoon. I appreciate you taking time to discuss, in what I believe, in a very forthright manner, perhaps some uh, uncomfortable areas of discussion, as well as discussions on what your party stands for and issues of major, major concern to the people of Fiji. May I take this opportunity in extending an open invitation to you and your party's delegates to appear on Sashi Singh's talking point in the future as Fiji gets ready for elections 2022 or 2023. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, Dhanivad, wishing you and your party all the very best for the future. Shashi, it's been a pleasure for having me on your show. I hope it's been worth it. And um, to, to me, it has been. Yes, and it has been to me as well. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, we would like to come back. Uh, you know, uh, you know how to get in contact with us. And um, I have found it. Most rewarding talking to you today, and I hope that people have also. And thank you very much. You are more than welcome, sir. God bless you. And uh, in the interest of fairness, I repeat that my invitation to the Attorney General, Mr. Iyar Sayyid Kayum, to participate in this program still stands. So far, I have had no response, and uh, I'm open to any government minister to participate in the program as well. Hopefully, Someone in the current government will agree to participate in the program in the near future. I'm not holding my breath, though. With or without them, Sashi Singh's talking point will make every effort to bring to the people of Fiji what makes the news. As I said, Fijians all over the world want to know answers. Well, that's it for Episode 8 on Sashi Singh's talking point. A big thank you to my regular contributor, Nikhil Singh, for his input in the program today. To my technical producer, Vin Shandil, a very, very big thank you as well. I would also like to thank uh, all our viewers for watching this afternoon. Now, next week, and this is the big reveal, who's our chief guest for next week? Next week, our chief guest on Sashi Singh's talking point will be the General Secretary of the Fiji Trades Union Congress, Mr. Felix Anthony. I believe it's time to talk to a trade unionist and uh, bring out issues that affect uh, the workers of Fiji as well. Now, I'm going to start a segment next week, hopefully with uh, our viewers' support. If you have any questions for Felix Anthony, you can privately message me on the SSTP page. Please like and follow the SSTP page so you can get instance, uh, rather instant notifications of the posts. I wish you all a very safe and blessed week. Remember, the United Nations... Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. I'm Sashi Singh, bidding you goodbye, namaste and ni samode. Thank you very much. Uh, world will catch up again next Sunday.